Jahaka Anchorage. Jahaka Anchorage is home to the band of pirates that is plaguing the seas all around Chult. Jahaka Anchorage is uh, the base of the pirates where they return and drop off all their swag. Uh, the place, as you can tell, is very hard to access by land and, uh, funnily enough, also hard to access by sea, as it is surrounded by Jahaka Bay. Uh, more on that later. But Jahaka Anchorage is one of the many places that has earned itself a beautiful map, so let's go ahead and pull ourselves over to that map. Jahaka Anchorage, as you can see here, is broken up into a larger map and a kind of mini-map. Uh, the larger map is in 10 square format, whereas this little mini map uh, is in a 5 square format. That little mini map is showing off the inside of this. It's basically a makeshift tavern that they are, the pirates are currently now using. Uh, the map, uh, as provided, comes with a ship that's currently docked, a ship that's out. Uh, as you read more about this, you'll understand that they actually have a pattern going on. There is three pirate ships, uh, all of which are detailed to actually a pretty a good amount of detail here. It goes into each of the captains and their crew. Uh, so let's get into that. The Dragon Fang, captain by Captain Elok. Um, he is a he's kind of a mean guy. He just came into power. He uh, he he basically killed the last captain and he's the captain now. And he is a no-nonsense, wants all the gold, wants everything kind of guy. He, however, as, as, you, as we go ahead and take a look here, he is not just any ordinary guy. He is a were-boar. That makes him extremely dangerous. If a low-level party goes up against this guy, and if they have zero silver weapons or magical weapons, he theoretically could just single them out. However... Uh, that's not the main issue. The main issue is that, in addition to him, he has a crew consisting of bandits, thugs, a druid, and a spy. Which, all together, that is, uh, that's a lot of freaking things to go up against. So, depending on what level your players are at, when they go up against these pirates, they'll be in for the fight of their lives. Next up, we have the Emerald Eye, captained by Captain Zeram al Sarak. This guy, uh, he's all about the gold, but he is a not not so much as a no nonsense guy. He actually is taking his job very seriously, so much so that he has actually cut a deal with Commander Liara Porter, the very captain of the Flaming Fist, to basically ensure that they don't attack any ships that uh, come from Baldur's Gate uh, for a share of the profits which uh, the commander of the Flaming Fist, Thayer Porter, certainly gets uh, some good uh, money out of because she's not losing any ships. This guy as well is is not as powerful. He's, he's only got the stat of a bandit captain, but still not terrible. What's interesting about him is that he has a bunch of money on him. If your players have already gotten the quest to capture this guy or, you know, capture a ship... They're already going to get a ton of gold just from all of that. But defeating this guy earns you a coat inlaid with gems worth 750 and a scimitar inlaid with gemstones for another 1,250. So this guy alone is going to get them a ton of money. Also interesting to note here, it says that he has a eye socket magical gem that lets him see ghostly pathways leading to treasure. But uh, the gem only works for him and no one else. So... There is no stat blocks on it. There is nothing else written about it. It's just a little flavor text there. But if you are a more adventurous DM, I would certainly recommend coming up with some fun little uh, homebrewed item or maybe take a look at some of the items and try and convert to something along that. Uh, much like the other captains, he is not alone. His crew consists of a berserker, a uh, whole bunch of bandits, uh, some thugs, and uh, some tribal warriors. All in all, his crew is actually the weakest of the three, but uh, and it, not only the weakest, but they also come with the most gold. Very interesting ordeal. Um, last but certainly not least, the Sturge, captained by Captain Laskalar, this flamboyant, rackish rogue. Uh, this guy as well, not really impressive stats, mind you. Um, 
this guy as well, he, what makes him interesting is that he is actually kind of tired of the whole pirate thing. You know, raiding the same trade ships that put up no effort and uh, only earn a little amount of gold here and there kind of gets boring. Uh, so he is actually willing to spice things up. He is willing to uh, try and track adventures down throughout the jungles or retreat to Port Nanzaru in order to earn a bit of gold. Uh, this can lead to a lot of fun roleplay elements if how they interact with the party. Maybe maybe they attack the pirate fort and retreat, but Captain Lascalar is still alive and tries to chase him down. Much like all the others, uh, his crew consists of an impressive uh, half first mate in a gladiator, half-orc, uh, a whole bunch of bandits, some thugs, and a priest. Uh, so all in all, uh, you read all about it. There's some fun little flavor text here. Uh, but it doesn't actually say how the pirates would actually engage with the adventurers. It's easily assumed that they are willing to fight them and capture them or kill them. Uh, but I will always recommend capturing players because capturing players leads to awesome roleplay elements of sneaking and sabotage and coercion and all those other fun things. So, uh, once we get into actually what this place is all about, we can see that uh, coming from the jungles, you would basically see a giant gate. Uh, overlooking the gate is actually a ballista, uh, which... Uh, can help them out in defending either against rampant undead dinosaurs or would-be adventurers trying to steal their hard-earned stolen goods. Next up, we have the pier, uh, in which the cargo is laid out for the ships as, you know, the pirates aren't going to simply have all of their, you know, hard-earned gains on board the whole time. That's going to slow down the ship. That's going to just, you know, cause a bigger mess. They're going to drop off all this stuff here. Uh, number three here, we have the officer's uh, shore quarters. Uh, it says that they simply stay here for a little bit of time, but mostly don't spend any time here, and there's nothing interesting here. Uh, number four, the warehouse, is where we get into the interesting stuff. So the warehouse is where they have all, a whole bunch of their loot. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is you not just anybody can walk in here. The place is actually booby trapped and if people walk in here without an eye patch on a whole bunch of uh animated swords spring out and attack them uh which you know swashbuckling with you know the invisible swords that's awesome i will go ahead and say uh for those of you that are playing on an online supplement uh for some reason the animated swords aren't put right there uh so you'd have to drag them on yourself but uh you know, as a good DM, you should be prepping ahead of time. There's some really good loot here. A decent amount of gold, silver, bronze, even some platinum, a whole bunch of items. Uh, nothing in regards of, uh, you know, magical loot other than some spell scrolls. But, you know, spell scrolls, depending on your party, either fizzle out or don't see much use at all. Number five, also very interesting, is the cage. So overlooking this little uh, lagoon here... Uh, there is a cage uh, set into the wall. Uh, what's, what's interesting here is that uh, you can't really access it unless you go by a, a ship uh, because it's a little bit higher above the water. And what's even more terrifying is that below the water is, are a bunch of reef sharks. So uh, and people that try and escape, uh, if they're able to open up the cage, are usually met by a score of reef sharks, which is certainly not good. And this is where I was talking about with the fun roleplay elements. If your players are captured, uh, having them in here will certainly make them have to think on how to get out. It also recommends that uh, there is some other people that are captured here, which I certainly agree with. I think that you, if, if your players, whether they get captured or they storm the place, they should certainly find some interesting characters locked up in here that can join their party, uh, that can help them out. Uh, or, you know, maybe people that they have met before throughout the adventure. It also recommends that if they haven't encountered Artist Simber and Dragon Bait yet, uh, you can find them here. Uh, you know, depending on if at all you want to add Artist Simber and Dragon Bait into your adventure, this is certainly a fun way to introduce them. However, it it's with saying that it, it I don't see a way that Artist Simber and Dragon Bait would actually get captured because they're so powerful. So that would probably lead to 
they snuck in or are trying to get people out or they feigned their weakness and, you know, are, are trying to find some information out. You know, play it by ear. Do it what you will. The watchtower here is above the uh, above the the, uh, the the cafe the the bar area. It basically shows off the watchtower and how there are several. Uh, there is the ballista that overlooks the front gate. Uh, it's it's normally banned manned by several pirates and uh, they will ring an alarm if things go down. Uh, and there's a spiral staircase that leads down and of course it leads to further areas. Bosco's Bilge. So Bosco's Bilge is the ship that has been converted now into this off-duty uh, bar. It is currently uh, the current proprietor is Bosco Daggerhand, who uh, he is. He's not really like with the pirates. He's he's more here just on circumstance, and uh, he wouldn't want to just get in with like a fight because. He's probably smart enough to know that, you know, if the if if the ventures are doing a pretty good job mopping up all these pirates, he probably doesn't want to get in uh, in with it. Also, a fun little uh, role play element here is that he's got a small little dynanicus named Knuckles. It's named Knuckles because it usually bites people's uh, hands. Uh, in uh, Bosco's uh, area here, we can actually go ahead and zoom in now to the actual bar itself. Where we can see, of course, uh, much like all the other uh, online supplements, it does not provide actual art for a named character. So I would suggest finding some good art as well. You can certainly find some on the TOA Discord. Uh, the kitchen, uh, it simply states that, you know, he just, he makes the food here. Nothing really special about it. Um, but Bosco's bunk is the interesting part. Uh, there, He's got a little hammock in there and he's got all of his goods. He's actually got a decent amount of loot uh, tucked away in here, uh, so if the if the players uh, you know find themselves in here and are on a, the rampaging looting spree, they can certainly find themselves a whole bunch of uh, gold and potions of water breathing, and also funnily enough the eye patches. If the players don't interact with anybody at all, they just go in you know swords blazing, no interactions at all. They're not going to know that you need a eye patch to get into the treasury, uh, lest you get into a fight with some animated swords. So if your players do find themselves uh, trapped in here or, you know, talking with the pirates some more, they may discover that, you know, oh, hey, you know, why is it that all these people that aren't blind are always rocking these eye patches? But yeah, Jockey Anchorage has a lot of things going on for it. Sadly, it doesn't actually go into the actual how to roleplay said people. It, it simply states, you know, how the individual uh, pirates kind of act. There's a lot of ways you can handle this. You so so the thing you got to consider is uh, at any given time there is one ship docked away, there is one ship in the bay, and there is one ship always raiding. And so all these ships are on this uh, little rotation of rest, uh, guard duty, and attack duty. Uh, so you know, come up with it as you will. You know, maybe you know, maybe if you like a certain um, ship o over another, uh, you can you can have them engage out if if your players are coming by boat. Uh, but if they're coming by land, maybe you know, uh, maybe they have some type of Maybe it, they're just coming into a rotation and they see more pirates and they begin to understand the rotation cycle. There is so many ways you can handle this in regards of if this is just a flat out dungeon romp, killing pirates and stealing loot. If this is a high seas roaring adventure of dealing with pirates in the open seas. Or if this is a fun role play encounter of interacting with the pirate intricacies of... Oh, should we keep dealing with uh, Liara Porter, or should we break our deal? Should we start attacking more things? Should we, you know, should we attack Port Nine Zaru itself? There's so many things you can go with this in so many different directions, but it really comes down to you. I will say that the, um, the what the biggest thing about the whole pirate excursions it really comes down to what level your players are 
As I showed you earlier, some of the crews are not only strong, but they are big. And if they're fighting either on their home territory or if they are fighting uh, on the seas, uh, really put, depends on, you know, your players' power levels. I would recommend that, you know, straight up, like, low-level parties, they will get the floor mopped with them by some of these crews, especially, like I said, one of the captains can't even be hurt if they don't have magic on their side. So, really play it by ear, really, really play it out, depending on how, how high level your players are, and uh, maybe introduce some more roleplay elements in regards of maybe some of the pirates uh, are in Port Zaru, and maybe some of your players overhear some fun, juicy things that the pi pirates get up to. Jahaka Bay. Jahaka Bay uh, is, of course, the bay in which resides Jahaka Anchorage and also leads to the River Tath, which flows down a, a decent bit into the jungles of Chult. Jahaka Bay is uh, perpetually plunged in mist, and this really helps out uh, the pirates uh, not be found. In addition to that, it also is uh, that if you are a not-so-great uh, captain and you're going blind, you can actually run your ship amok uh, trying to get yourself into the anchorage. Uh, if your players either are using a ship that they got themselves or hired out one of uh, hired out the the brazen Pegasus, um, they're probably going to find themselves in a terrible time uh, trying to uh, navigate these mists here. There's really not too much going on other than um, yeah, th this is one of the this is one of the entry points into the jungles of Chult. Which, like I said before, uh, could be an interesting way into the jungles, as they could go down the river Tath and maybe get a quick way to Oralonga, or a quick way to the Aldani Basin, or any, or a quick way to any other places that they uh, currently might know about on the campaign map. Kirsabal. Kirsabal is the nesting place of an Aarakocra tribe that rests high up on a mountain cliff. Uh, a high atop monastery. Once again, this is one of the uh, many places that has earned itself a gorgeous map and uh, some fun role-playing elements as well. So let's go ahead and dive right into that, shall we? Kir Sabal is this crumbling monastery that rests hundreds, and you know, approximately 500 uh, feet above ground. And, uh, like I said, is home to tribe of Aarakocras that uh, have been here for quite some time. Uh, the funny thing about this is they, the, they as in the Aarakocra, uh, don't really upkeep this place in regards of the, uh, the walkway because <laughs> they, they fly. Why would they need to you know, walk up here? So that actually introduces the issue of actually how to get up here in the first place. The players look up and they can see this thing, but uh, to climb it is a huge deal. There's a whole bunch of checks involved, and it, it can actually be very dangerous if your players are not doing things smart. Once they actually arrive and interact with the community, they come to find that these Aarakocra are a peaceful folk uh, that simply are trying to reside and live a simple life. Uh, high above the dangerous jungles of Chult. They only come down to gather food and scout the place out and protect it. Uh, what makes this place uh, also interesting is the fact that there are several roads that lead here. The players could have met in Aarakocra uh, from the Firefinger that tells them to come here. They might have heard that uh, Kirzabal is home to Aarakocra. And also interesting is this is one of the few places on the map that the players actually have from the very beginning with uh, no actual indication of what it actually is. Once they arrive, they find that uh, it says that 56 Aarakocra live here. Uh, they are governed by a older Aarakocra named Ashara. Ashara is uh, written as old, and but very wise, and she's also powerful. Uh, she is a higher level spellcaster, and she, she's got some fun spells. Call lightning, not bad. Hold person, hold person 500 feet up, give him a little shove. Works every time. 
She, however, once again, is also not uh, looking for a fight. She's actually welcoming of uh, adventurers that come in here as long as they play nice. In fact, if she, if the players are actually really get on the air coker's good side, Ashara will actually tell them of a fantastic ritual that can give them a flight speed, which is a big deal because uh, giving the players a fly speed of a pretty high amount uh, of 30 feet around, giving them a fly speed of 30 feet around, which allows them to fly four miles per hour. You take that back to the map, that means that they can cover a hex in three hours. They can fly. And more importantly, they're not dealing with the dangerous things that lie below. They're not dealing with all the dinosaurs and undead and other things. They're just simply flying over. So if your players actually plan this out and get this thing and know where they want to go, they can easily reach anywhere uh, on the map. However, the, the, of course, downside to this is that the benefit lasts for three days after which the ritual ends. So this is a big deal, and this will lead into the side quest that is all about it. But let me go ahead and go by the books here. So once they arrive uh, in Kirsabal, they, are, of course, are met by all these be these nice Arakokra, and uh, they also meet two interesting figures, Princess Mwaxanare and Na. These two are the last descendants of Cholten royalty in all of Cholt. Uh, their great great grandparents uh, were rulers, and in fact, their great grandmother, Napaka, was the last ruling queen of Omu. You will actually come to find her resting place once your players actually arrive in the Tomb of Annihilation. Princess Maxinare, she believes that uh, she's the rightful queen of Cholt because she's been groomed her whole life to believe this. Also to the point where Mwaxanare uh, describes that places all around Cholt uh, are the principalities or holdings, the holdings of Waterdeep, the principalities of Alm, and so on, uh, which uh, can really shine a light uh, to your players on how she was raised by Ashara and the Arakokra. Uh, I have run this m many times, and it always is finicky. Your players might think to themselves, are, are, is she being brainwashed? Is she dumb? Is she misinformed? What's going on here? It truly is that she she hasn't been taught everything, and she also, uh, her personality makes her uh, very stubborn in that regard. The younger brother, Na, he is just a delightful little kid and uh, thinks that the Aarakocra are so neat, and uh, you know he he really doesn't add too much because he's he's just a little too young to actually be <laughs> you know admitting anything here. So Mwaxinare, uh tells the players that to solidify her 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 claim to all of Omu, she wants a very symbolic item to be retrieved. And that is the lost treasure called the Skull Chalice of Chigagare. It's one of the fabled treasures that your players can find in the Tomb of Annihilation itself. And is pretty awesome. It's funny how there there is some story beats on finding uh, some of these awesome uh, uh, treasures when they are found in literally the last place of the adventure. But usually you kind of, you know, wrap those up in a... Uh, what happens afterwards kind of thing. So area one is the monastery. So the monastery is this, you know, pretty nice looking place that, you know, can see, you can see out into the jungles and the Arakokra, you know, simply fly up here, no issue. It details, this area details out all the little areas, the antechambers and the prayer halls and the shrines and all of that. Th something to note, though, is that there is uh, not too much loot to be found uh, here, anyway. Area 2, uh, the cleansing chambers. Uh, once again, more little areas uh, that really flesh out the roleplay area of this nature. There is... Uh, they, these these air cooker lead a very humble life. They they don't need technologies. They don't need any fixtures of the sort. They simply just need 
you know, food, water, and, you know, a place to clean themselves and a house over their heads. And that's, that's all they really got. Area three, the elder's house. Uh, much like all the other places, it details out uh, more just role play elements of you know, the area in which they reside in. This is a place that does have some loot for those that have, uh, you know, sticky fingers. There are some uh, potions of uh, poisons and potions of healing. It, it, it says here that the potions of poison uh, are used by Ashara, who might resort to these if the character's presence is inconvenient. Uh, it sort of details out that Ashara is not evil by any means. She is ne lawful neutral. Uh, but she doesn't want any harm to come to any of her people, the Aarakocra and uh, the uh, the princess and the prince. Uh, so she will resort to uh, telling the players to go away or you know other extremes if they refuse. Uh, so that that is a fun little element of you know maybe maybe she's put, putting on a good face and then she says go away here have these potions uh, please go away and then. They drink these potions of poison, <laughs> lead to a, a dead character or two. Because last time I checked, potion of poison is not pleasant. Uh, area four here is the dwellings. It details out all the various little dwellings. There's a whole bunch of them. Very simple stuff. Um, they they're just small little houses. Nothing major. Lastly, of course, area five is the the uh, the royal house, which also doesn't have anything uh, to note, really. The last area, Area 5, uh, doesn't really have much going on for it either. It simply details where the prince and the princess might reside. Once again, there's also uh, some nice little loot for the sticky fingers of the party. Uh, some jewels and uh, jewelries and all kinds of various things. However, it is important to note that uh, if anything goes missing, uh, Ashar is immediately going to suspect that the players did it because her and Aarakocra have no reason to steal these things and uh, your players are here. It's in, they, they shook the boat. So let's get down to it. When your players arrive here, either because they've been told about it or heard about it, or they're coming because Nefir, the Aarakocra from Firefinger, told them to come here and perform the Dance of the Seven Winds, uh, they can actually go to Ashara, and our Ashara will tell them that uh, she will give them a, this flight speed for several days, provided that they find a specific item, an orchid, uh, this orchid, however, can only be found in one place. Nangalore, a ruinous shrine. This place is uh, pretty scary because residing there is a whole bunch of nasty crawlies and a medusa. But we will get into Nangalore at a later time. Lastly here, for the little handout for Kirsa Ball, it says when gargoyles attack. Uh, it states that era the gargoyles could attack uh, in a little group. Uh, it doesn't specifically say, you know, what what their purpose would be or what they're doing or anything of that nature. They are, the Aarakocra and the Gargoyles have a long-standing feud as the Gargoyles simply want to kill anything that flies around. And uh, something important to note, if you do have any type of combat encounter where Gargoyles come and attack uh, and the Aarakocra are defending, if you do it off screen, off initiative, off you know screen, whatever the case may be, you can have the fight presented however it is. If you take it down to initiative, you've got to note that Aarakocra stat blocks are incredibly weak, especially compared to Gargoyles. Gargoyles are incredibly strong. They have a pretty decent health pool, and they take only half of the damage that the Aarakocra put out. And the Aarakocra can easily get killed in a single... Uh, set of attacks from a single gargoyle. Uh, so, if you want to play it exactly as written, where there's only 56, uh, I promise you that if any gargoyles come, uh, that number is going to dwindle significantly. Kitcher's Inlet. 
Kitcher's Inlet is, once again, one of the many named places here that has just only a paragraph of text, nothing major. There seems to be a little Marco Polo joke thrown in here about someone who says they discovered this place, but it was already long since discovered. Uh, there really isn't uh, too much here, other than Port Castellagar, which sadly, uh, there is nothing there as well. Lake Luo. Lake Luo is a rather large uh, ruinous lake that resides between uh, the jungles and the Valley of Embers. Uh, this place is written as being a boiling, toxic place, a dead wasteland filled with mud and steam methods that prowl around. Uh, and the place is disgusting and uh, there's not much here going on. Uh, yeah, pretty pretty simple stuff. There really isn't too much going on here. Uh, hopefully, you do not see your players anywhere near the Valley of Dread. And hopefully, they have no reason to go anywhere past the lake. Uh, but they could possibly pass through the lake if they were to, say, come from Hisari and try and make their way to the jungle proper, uh, going in a straight line. Uh, but once again, you know, as per written, not really too much going on. Land of Ash and Smoke. Land of Ashes Smoke is uh, not a jungle at all. This place is a sea of ash and uh, ruin as the active volcanoes certainly prevent any vegetation from growing here in mass. It's said that a red dragon and fire nudes use this place as a playground, uh, which is interesting because the, the fire nudes look uh home is actually pretty freaking far away from the land of ash and smoke um uh, i don't know why they would you know be coming all the way over here when you know their base is all the way over here you know hundreds of miles away whatever the case may be the dragon could certainly uh come here in a moment's time uh once again uh not too much going on here it, it's this little thing that's it says here that not too many people come here and that's probably for a good reason the place uh, would certainly be hot, it'd be miserable, and who knows, if your player has come into contact with a red dragon out in the middle of the open, that could certainly lead to disaster. I know I've killed a PC or two that's gone up against a red dragon in the middle of the open. Mbala. Mbala is a very unique place. It is a humongous plateau that resides just over the Aldani Basin, not terribly far away from Camp Vengeance. Uh, your players will be able to see this from far away and realize that uh, people actually come here. And as well, there's also this is also one of the places that your players actually are privy to the name of uh, on their player map. What's really interesting about this is there's a fairly decent amount written about Mbala. And in fact, I'll, I'm getting into that in a moment. Uh, a named character and a very unique gameplay mechanic and some treasure here. And even a little quest. But, uh, sadly, the, there is no actual map for it. I will go ahead and be pulling up a map here uh, that it was created uh, for use on the DO, TOA Discord. Um, but it, it is a little bit of a shame, but I can understand why there wasn't uh, a need to make this, because uh, there really isn't expected to be too much combat going on here. So this here is the map. So Mbala is this huge 1800 foot plateau uh, where once a uh, small settlement resided now crumbling in ruins there is only one way up and it is a crumbling cliff that is three miles and uh, three miles uh, going up is a freaking long trek uh, so th there's some there's some stuff written here about yeah, so it says that it takes a, a three hours to climb, which is uh, a pretty big ordeal. And depending on the weather, once they crest the top, they'll be able to see all the jungle around them for a very, very large distance. In fact, it actually says that they can spot a shipwreck uh, very far away. Let me go ahead and pull out the map here to see how far away it actually says. So it says when they crest the top, they can actually see the wreck of the Star Goddess to the south, which is 100 miles away. I don't know if, uh, I don't know exactly how well you can see 100 miles away, but I probably would recommend uh, that they 
don't have that unless they have a spyglass or some magic to let them see very far away. Uh, but what's interesting about Mbala and why it is actually a name settlement and why it's a big deal is because of the woman that resides there. Her name is Nanny Poo Poo. Funny name and uh, set aside, Nanny Poo Poo is in fact a hag. She is a pretty powerful hag, honestly. She's a uh, she, she's she got some stuff going on for her. However, she is not part of any coven. She is simply by herself and she resides here. The reason why this place is in ruins is because she ate everyone else that was residing around here. A pretty grisly affair. Uh, and in fact, there is the guide Eku who knows of the atrocities that she's committed and actually wants to rid the world of her. However, unless your players have Eku with her or you've seeded some information elsewhere, they're not going to know that this woman is the source of all the woes that happened here. However, uh, it will become very apparent that she clearly has some wicked magic because she is offering to resurrect dead players. The whole theme of this campaign is that you cannot resurrect people and everyone that's been resurrected is already slowly dying, which makes this a very, very interesting moral conundrum. If you have a set of characters and some of them die and uh, they want to be brought back by the remainder of the party, they can make a deal to bring them back to life. This is a grisly ritual, however. This isn't just a simple magic spell, one and done. This is a, a very, very, you know, evil thing. In order to do it, they must bring a gemstone worth 100 GP. That's not the grisly part. The grisly part is that in order to do this, you need to sacrifice another living humanoid. If your players are willing to dip their moral, you know, lose karma uh, to bring back their one of their dead compatriots, they're either going to have to find someone uh, willing or more often than not, take someone unwillingly as a sacrifice. Uh, it, it says that uh, she recommends going out and finding either a goblin or a grung to do this. Uh, but you can make a whole quest in it of itself to try and capture someone in order to sacrifice them. The gameplay uh, ramifications of this ritual are that the character that has been brought back to life is now considered undead and subject to all the effects that are undead. Two, if their hit point maximum is reduced by 1d4 at dawn each day, rep representing their decay. And lastly, if the character's hit point maximum drops to zero, the gemstone embedded in a character's forehead shatters, and the character becomes a corpse once more. A corpse, a character that is turned into the walking dead and later raised or resurrected loses all memory of being undead creature, but it doesn't lose any levels of XP gained. So, there is a lot of ways I have seen this ritual played out, and a lot of ways I've heard this ritual play out, I, there, there's no one way you can recommend this, right? If you want to have a hardcore campaign where people die and people are meant to die, then I would recommend running it as written. You lose a D4 of HP each day. That makes wanting to trek through the jungle even more terrifying as you really want to go to where you're going. Uh, if you have a game where you want people players to live and unfortunately one of them died somehow then maybe you reduce that 1d4 of hp down to something else uh you know whether it be like a d3 a d2 or just flat out one or maybe even if they just don't lose any hp at all um i there is it, there's no one way i can recommend it. it 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 comes down on a group by group basis i will say though um, it doesn't, it doesn't say that they can't redo the ritual, um, which does, you know, present the fun little thing of, 
oh, hey, we know on average we can go like 30 days out because you've got this much HP. Let's let's go here and then come back and bring you back to life. You, you can have those fun little, like, you know, that element of planning ahead of time uh, baked into it. There's there's a lot of things you can do with it. Uh, ritual aside, uh, it says that she has some swag with her, as all, you know, good little things do. She has a spell scroll of comprehending languages and some gold and um, some fun stuff. But what's interesting is uh, she also presents the party with a quest. Uh, she will go ahead and explain that the nasty terra folk that are embedded in the side of Mbala are the cause of all the people that died around here, and she wants them taken care of. Uh, that's more so that she just wants, you know, the place to herself, and she wants she doesn't want to deal with these terror folk anymore. Uh, so that presents a fun little, um, you know, that presents this fun little mini adventure of finding this nest of terror folk and bringing them down, uh, which can be done in one of two ways: either one, they repel off the side of Mbala. Or two, they spend some time searching for a chimney that they can sneak into the back of. Uh, the Terra Folk are, can be played much like they can in Firefinger. They totally want to throw people you know, and make them fall hundreds of feet because that's way easier than dealing with stabbing someone to death. All in all, Mbala is a very significant place and it's the most significant place actually that doesn't have a map involved with it natively. So I would recommend that if your players are heading there, find something you know substantial that they can use, much like this map, or you know find something yourself. Um, the whole aspect of being brought back to life uh, is a pretty tempting one, depending on the campaign that you're running and all that. But the cost to do so is very morally not even gray. It's just terrible. So I would recommend that if you have a group that is on the up and up and doesn't want to do that, but you want the mechanic to be included, maybe you have the cost to be something else. Maybe the cost includes more gold, or maybe they have to give up some type of magical item or something. There certainly should be a cost involved with bringing someone back from the dead, considering that the whole premises of this campaign is that no one can be brought back to life. And depending on your group, depending on your needs, depending on your wants, uh, change up the mechanic of uh, players slowly dying again as you see fit. Mesro. Mesro is a very unique place as it is one of the major ruins that uh, resides within all of Chult. Uh, sadly, uh, this place did not get itself a made map. Uh, it does go into a little bit of detail, though, and it's pretty interesting. The people of Mesro uh, didn't die with the city with a spell plague. They essentially transported themselves to a demiplane and were able to avoid the worst of it, uh, which is very good. Artis Simber's wife is actually among them. Uh, the Artis Simber is, while he look, may look normal age, uh, you know, if I mentioned maybe he's in his 30s or 40s, he's actually very old. The Ring of Winter is preserving his life. He misses his wife dearly. It's been a hundred some odd years since he's seen her. So uh, he, he, every once in a while, he comes back to see if, uh, if they've come back or not. So in regards of exploring the ruins, there's a little bit of detail. It says that the Flaming Fist have all but taking everything because it's it is relatively close to Port Nanzaru, which is very believable. Uh, it is one of the closest major settlements. It is actually easy to access both on foot and by ship, as it is just in the Kitra's Inlet. However, I would recommend that if you were looking into fleshing this out more, there's an excellent DM's Guild supplement that adds to the city of Mesro, adding some fun encounters and roleplay elements. Other than that, there really isn't too much to say. Uh, this place uh, is just another one of those places that really makes the world feel like it's real. It, it's another one of the, the places that flushes out Schult and makes it feel like a real place and makes it feel like it's lived in. However, sadly, not enough book space was allotted to give a map for it or give enough uh, information on it. Mistglyph. 
Miss Cliff is uh, this this place that is on the northern side of Chult, uh, you know, spanning the the Miss Cliff Mountains in this wide range. It says that this is a thousand foot wall of volcanic rock that stretches hundreds of miles. It's home to uh, all types of flying creatures, Aarakocras, Pteranodons, Quetzalcoatls, and most likely um, Terrafolk as well. It is, uh, as, as written, it, it's inaccessible. There really isn't any way to get past it. Which is interesting, you can see on the map here that there is a little like place for your players to possibly make their way through. Uh, possibly a way for them to return if they were to go there. But you know what's interesting is you can see that there is a little place right here with uh, no vegetation, which makes me believe that there is something there. There just isn't anything written about it. Uh, you know, once again, just another one of these places that flushes out the world. Nangalore. Nangalore is a beautiful garden that has sadly gone overgrown and it currently in it resides a long uh, forgotten queen of Chult. She, however, had made a terrible deal and is now immortal is what it seems like, but at least only in age. She has transformed into a Medusa. This has a beautiful map, so let's go ahead and bust this. All right. Yeah, so in Angalore, you can see that a lot is going on here. This this place is huge. It's intricately detailed. Ugh, I love I love the art style of these maps. You just I, you can't get enough of it. All right, so let's go ahead and just dive straight into this thing. So Nangalore uh, was made for the uh, the o Omun Queen Zalcore. Uh, she she would often come here on vacation, and you know nice and relax. Unfortunately, at some point during her reign, there seems to have been uh, some uh, discourse uh, with the court, and uh, she, in her hatred uh, of being exiled to this place, defaced all of these stone statues uh, depicting her lover. She originally thought that her lover uh, was the one that did all this. Uh, she unfortunately found it too little too late. So, to reminisce in her time here, she gets high on drugs, essentially, and this is the only thing that can make her happy, is only in the this, this state of uh, psychedelics is she able to recall her lover's face. Residing in these, this garden of Nangalore are a, a few ebli, the cranes that are evil and can talk in common. There's also some spiders here. There's some uh, nasty plant creatures here, and there's some alligators here. Uh, so let's go ahead and start navigating this uh, interesting map here. It uh, before we get into the entrance, it says that uh, getting to Nangalore on foot is a bit of a nightmare because the surrounding area is boggy swamp. Uh, it doesn't actually say anything in regards of how to get here through this boggy swamp, but you can probably just label it as, oh, everything's difficult terrain, and maybe you roll up a bit more encounters around here. It says that the only the best way to get to Nangalore is by going uh, by water, in which case that, that is where the entrance is. So if your players arrive by water, they will find themselves in Nangalore. Well, they'll actually come across, uh, funnily enough, these uh, strange uh, faces. And these faces, they will be damaged and things will be written all over them. It'll actually paint the scene of, uh, of Zalcore and her betrayal. She, uh, in her in her hatred, defaced these things and basically documents her fall into this this madness. All right, the terraces. The terraces are nastily overgrown. Residing all around this place are man traps and yellow musk creepers. Uh, as they go ahead and explore around a bit, uh, there's a actually a fun little uh, garden discovery uh, encounter table here. 
uh, which is very big because they could find themselves a folding boat. And a folding boat in this campaign wouldn't be that bad. Uh, other than that, uh, basically, they, they'll just be exploring around to this place. And it's a pretty unique place. You know, this is, you know, it, it, unlike the jungle, which is completely ravaged and, uh, you know, untamed, this place still has a, a semblance of, of beauty and structure to it. And uh, you should be describing all the sights and sounds uh, of this awesome place. All right, the spirit domes. You can see that the spirit domes have uh, has seen better days as currently uh, a giant spider has taken over this place. Um, it actually goes into a little detail here that this uh, the spider is actually missing one of its legs. It actually goes into a little bit of detail about this spider saying it's got seven legs and there's the bodies of a uh, dwarf and a goblin here, but no treasure. Uh, it also states that there is a um, that there is a chewinga to be found in one of the uh, the the domes, and it will totally give a charm of restoration, which could be pretty big because of what they might be up against. In the ruined palace, uh, they'll discover that the place has you know suffered the ages of time. And uh, is actually on the brink of collapse. If uh, if they rummage around in there, they'll have to make deck saves or take a whole bunch of bludgeoning damage. They'll find the statue of this Chilton warrior standing above this water. And the water is home to a whole bunch of poisonous snakes. Uh, swarms of poisonous snakes are a little bit scary, but... Hopefully your players are a little bit higher level at this point. There's a whole bunch of written messages here in Old Omuin that tell Zalcora's tale of how she... Well, was sorry and um, and is is terribly sorry for defacing all the statues and she's super sad about all the things that transpired here. Uh, they actually find some statues in here too, and the statues are of people that Zalcori has petrified. Astute players will see statues uh, that are humanoid shaped and sized and and automatically scream danger danger. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you're, this doesn't give too much away. Area 5 is the hallucinogenic plants, uh, which uh, make Zalcore happy. And funnily enough, it also states here that it'll make Jessamine happy if you are able to bring some of this back. Uh, it, there really isn't too much going on here other than it, other than there is still more written words that you can be finding here that uh, still continue to spin the tale of how she uses these drugs to cope. And as well as they'll totally find themselves in the maws of a man trap and some uh, uh, triflower fawns if they make their way in here. Area 6, the Pagoda. It is currently home to the Abli that are using this place as uh, just a place to hang out. And uh, it states that the Abli are simply waiting here. And unless the characters haven't gotten in any combat and have been deathly silent, uh, more than likely, uh, They'll hear something, and three of the Iblis will run over to Zalcore and uh, defend her. Their job is to not to attack intruders on site, but to alert Zalcore. So that can lead to some fun roleplay elements of, if your players haven't already interacted with Ibli in the campaign, uh, talking to a random, you know, uh, talking to a bird can certainly be interesting. Area 7, the Flooded Garden, uh, there is just a whole bunch of more statues and toppled... Uh, no structure. Uh, there are, once again, some more um, petrified peoples here, uh, but really uh, just, you know, just an in-between connector area. Really nothing too fancy. Area 8 is Zalcore's Lair, and this is the whole shebang. So unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, not, every, not every named character can get a picture. Unfortunately, Zalcore is one of them. I would strongly recommend that you get a awesome picture for Zalcore. It specifically states that Zalcore is not uh, rocking around like this. She's not. She doesn't have her snakes out. Uh, she is actually wearing a uh, veil of sorts uh, to, you know, not be so scary looking and all that. So it says that Zalcore isn't completely insane. Uh, but she hallucinates, and so she sees things, uh, mostly like, you know, past events. And she spent uh, more than a lifetime uh, in this place. She, she has been stuck here for 
who knows how many hundreds of years. She thinks that she's the queen of Omu while also remembering that she was exiled here. And uh, she is sort of in and out of a trance, really, while interacting with uh, the Ebli and with the characters. Uh, it basically says here that um, she will be kind unless they do this, this, or that, which basically include, um, you know, damaging anything, uh, bringing up the betrayal, or uh, taking away her veil. At which point, uh, combat will totally break out, and uh, the Abli will come and help her out, but depending on what level the party is... Uh, uh, she can probably deal with them herself. What's really interesting about her is that it specifically says uh, she's got a special ability. If she were to be damaged uh, below 63 HP, she calls out the spirit of her dead lover, who's this 10-foot tall apparition. What is even more uh, scary is uh, this thing, is the, the spirit that is protecting her, is does a pretty freaking good job. Uh, if anybody within 15 feet of Zalcore damages her, the aberration unerringly hits the attacker, dealing 2d8 plus 6 force damage. Almost nobody or anybody will ever have resistance to force damage, and that's just free damage every single time they hit her. That's going to really hurt the people that are in melee smacking her. Um, in addition to that, of course, uh, it's really hard to be smacking her in the first place because... Your players hopefully are uh, smart enough to close their eyes as to not get petrified. This fight is dangerous. The uh, bleed pecking at their backs, the the constant fear of being petrified, dealing with her uh, just fit, her physical attack. She that snake hair is dangerous. And once they damage her enough, all of a sudden a spirit appears and she goes into a beast mode. Uh, hopefully your, uh, players are, you know, bulky enough or, you know, smart enough to somehow deal with this encounter, but I've certainly seen, uh, stronger parties felled, uh, by being dumb and getting into a fight with Zalcore. It doesn't have to go into a combat, obviously. Your players can roleplay the bejesus out of this. Uh, in which case, the, the most likely reason why they're here is because they're here for a black orchid. Uh, they can try and just come here and steal away a Black Orchid. However, if they are going down the role-playing approach, uh, they need to basically uh, trade to get this Black Orchid. She is not willing, uh, Zalcore is not willing, to part ways the Black Orchid unless uh, she is given something of, uh, e of what she deems to be equal value, which is essentially... A uh, gemstone, piece of jewelry, or an art object worth 500 GP. Um, it says that she won't accept lesser quality goods or of equal value. She wants one big thing. I, you know, depending on how you run your campaign and depending on where, where they've gone and stuff, it's kind of unlikely that they're just traipsing around with, you know, this awesome painting or like this big gemstone. It's fairly not likely. Uh, but that being the case, maybe, if that's the case, maybe, you know, um, if you don't, if, if there's no chance that they're ever going to have something like this, maybe do lean up on maybe if they offer up enough gemstones or piece of jewelry or whatever, or the alternative, it's, it does state here that she is willing to take on anybody with a charisma of 16 or higher as a slave as she finds them, uh, attractive, uh, <laughs> I can't imagine too many people wanting to end their career over getting this, uh, you know, to be a slave. But that in itself presents some fun opportunities. Maybe they do enter, you know, this pact and become a slave, but then try and bust out the next night or whatever. So uh, what happens if uh, there's the middle in between? What if what if the combat doesn't break out, but Zakori doesn't like these people? Uh, that is when she presents her poisonous hospitality. She will totally offer the party uh, food and drink, but poison it. And after some time, uh, the players will be poisoned unless they make a DC 15 con save. After which point, uh, once they're poisoned, is when she and the Abli are going to strike. Uh, I can easily tell you right now, if the majority of your party is poisoned, and they've got to go up against Zalcore and a flock of Abli, they're probably in for uh, a, a casual TPK as uh, being poisoned, having disadvantage on everything, 
and going up against uh, you know an enemy that you got to fight blind or be po or be or be stoned and you know all these factors it is not fun stuff and that being said if your players do either get the jump on her or you know sneak in or you know come up with any one of the various ways to deal with uh, you know you know players find a way <laughs> life finds a way players find a way uh, if they do end up ransacking this place, they find some pretty decent loot. They find uh, they find some gold uh, worth of jewelry here. They find uh, some of the they find some of the vials of the the hallucinogen she uses. And but most important of all is that they can retrieve the black orchid in order to complete the dance of the seven winds and earn that sweet sweet fly speed. All in all, Nangalore is a very interesting place. Uh, it is a very interesting dungeon crawl in a sense of there's the, the one best way to go uh, basically leads you along this Disney Park path of finding out a bit of lore before you actually meet this woman. And uh, there's some fun little combat encounters along the way dealing with a variety. You go up against some alligators, you go up against some... You know, un planty undead things. You go up against some spiders. You go up against some snakes. You go up against some. The list goes on. And all in all, Nangalore is a pretty fun place. Heck, I've you know I've ran this as a one shot because this is just uh, such an interesting uh, location and uh, place. Uh, but don't take this for granted. And more importantly, uh, don't take it. Don't let your players take a Medusa for granted either. Uh, all in all. Ninglore, great times, great times, fun stuff. There is, uh, I can't speak highly enough of how fun of a little uh, role play slash combat encounter this is. Needles Bones. Needles Bones is the graveyard of a uh, green dragon that died long ago. Uh, the interesting thing about this location is... Needle's Bones is the graveyard of a green dragon that died here long, long ago. This place uh, can be found through either some rumors or by hiring the guides Gondolo and Feral, as they actually have a map leading straight to this place. Sadly, Needle's Bones is just shy of enough material to have given it a map. Uh, so you will have to come up with a map uh, of it yourself or find one uh, somewhere on the interwebs. More than likely, you can find it on the TOA Discord. So what is Neil's Bones? When they arrive there, they find that basically there's this pit and there's a whole bunch of bones in it. A whole bunch of green dragons uh, bones and some goblin bones. At one point, this green dragon comes back to its later. And a whole whole tribe of goblins ambushed this thing. They were able to actually somehow stop this thing. They, they presumably they uh, they netted the thing and they threw spears at it. However, many though the entire goblin tribe died in the the fight as well. So what do they find when they get there? They find that uh, if they they hop down, uh, they discover that the place is murky, muddy. And it's actually filled with swarms of quippers. Uh, so that leads to a fun little, you know, combat encounter of, you know, oh, you're you're in waist high water and you got to deal with a swarm of quippers. Not fun times. If they actually start looking around, though, they start, you know, patting the walls and stuff. They can actually find the hidden uh, treasure in a small hidden room uh, located in this grotto. They'll actually discover. Um, uh, a fun little like trick uh, door that the the dragon essentially made. That's got a, some pretty decent loot. A little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, uh, but it comes with a wand of fear and uh, some sling bullets. Sadly, over the course of my entire DMing and playing career, I legitimately cannot think of any group that has ever had a sling. Uh, purely because slings do less damage than bows, and why would you use a sling? I would recommend that if you are, if your players go and do this, I would recommend that either one, you change the ammo type, or two, you give it way more ammo because 
magical ammo, unlike magical uh, arm or armors and magical uh, swords and all that, they actually lose their magic when they're used. So if you want someone to actually use a sling for the first time in their whole playing career, I'd recommend maybe giving like maybe 20 or 30, you know, sling bullets. Because plus one sling bullets, you know, that, I mean, that's cool. Like, get, make, a, make a weapon that's not usually used, used. In addition to that, of course, the Wand of Fear is a pretty big deal. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, if they're going up against a lot of undead, the, uh, the Wand of Fear isn't going to actually be doing too much. Uh, but against the other things, they can shoo them away. It's a, it's a pretty nice reward uh, for not too much work, honestly. Yeah, and most important of all, uh, Neil's Bones is actually located relatively close to a whole bunch of other hotspots. They can find the Wreck of the Narwhal, they can find Kyrus Ball, Tazmuhaha, and Nangalore. Uh, so, pretty neat locale. Uh, sad that it didn't get a map of its own, but uh, beggars cannot be choosers. The NC Waste. The NC Waste are basically one, another part of the jungle that's been blighted by the sickly poison. Uh, long ago, Raz Nisi's, uh undead horde rampaged through this place and uh, is absolutely destroyed and has not been uh, returned to its uh, former glory. Uh, yeah, really not too much going on here other than it does state that the chance for a random encounter is doubled in this region. Which is pretty interesting. So, the NC Waste is actually right next to Kyrsa Ball. So... If your players actually go to Kirsa Ball, they'll be looking down at this place and see this, you know, you know, large stretch of like this destroyed area, and they might be curious about it because it is a named place, but sadly, not too much going on. Omu, so Omu, I'm not going to cover because Omu is the entirety of Chapter Three, uh, but just a quick reference. Uh, here it is on the map. It's between the Valley of Lost Honor and Peak of Flames. Uh, something to note is that uh, no one, air quote no one, uh, no major entities or groups of people actually know where Omu is. And uh, that is, of course, where the Soulmonger resides, where the Tomb of Nine Gods resides. And um, that is where everyone is trying to find.